morning folks, Dave Canterbury at the Pathfinder School. What I thought I'd do this morning is I had a request from a very, very good friend of mine, Steve Davis, who owns the YouTube channel Stillwater Woodcraft. His YouTube name or handle is Woodcrafter76. Very good friend of mine, like I said, who does 18th century reenacting. And as I've talked about in past videos, I did 18th century reenacting for many years back in the early and mid 1990s. Spent lots of time in this exact same type of gear and it's where I learned a lot of the survival mentality and skills that I have today was adopted from the 18th century woodsman which goes right to my 21st century long hunter mentality. He asked me if I would shoot a video for him on a bow drill fire to put on his channel in his fire series. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a teaser of that video on my channel and then direct you if you want to see the video in its entirety to his channel at Stillwater Woodcraft to view this video in its entirety and I thought it only respectful to him because his channel is dedicated to the 18th century woodsmen and their skills that I would dress in 18th century attire and use 18th century mentality to make this bow drill fire. Stay with me. Okay, so the first thing we're going to need is we're going to need something to make our set from. Something to make our bow drill set out of. And you really want to use a softer type wood for making your entire set except for possibly the hand holder bearing block which you would make out of a piece of harder wood. This is tulip poplar. Tulip poplar is actually not a poplar. It is actually a member, it is a tulip tree and it's actually a member of the magnolia family. It's one of the seven species of magnolia. But it has the same properties as poplars. It was called yellow poplar during the days of the frontier. It was one of the first live trees exported to England for its qualities for carving and fine furniture. It's also the wood chosen by Daniel Boone to make his personal canoe. And you can see that it has a center in it when you cut it, and this one happens to be brown. Sometimes it's more of a purplish hue and sometimes it's green. But it will always have a dark center in it where the heartwood is. That will always be a dark color. When I cut a piece of wood for this, I like to make sure that the heartwood is not too big because the heartwood is going to be the hardest portion of this piece of wood. So I want to be able to split this off and have enough heartwood left over, or enough, sorry, enough sapwood left over on the outside that I can make my bow drill fire in that sapwood and not get into the heartwood unless I absolutely have to. So I've cut this off with a saw. Saws were very common in the 18th century, mostly frame type bucking saws. And I'm going to split this down now with my knife by batoning it. And then we will make our entire set, except for the bearing block, from this. And then we'll have to find cordage for our bow drill and we'll talk about that when we get there. Okay, if we are batoning our piece of wood and it starts to get real stubborn, we're banging on the tip of our knife and all that good stuff and we don't have an axe, we can always use a simple wedge and insert it into the top and pound it down with our baton to help us split that out just like that. And you can see that's splitting that wide open. And that was just a simple piece of maple that I wedged on one side. It doesn't have to be a wedge wedge. It can just be like a chisel point. And I just pounded that piece of maple down inside that crack with my baton. Got my knife back. No harm, no foul. Got my wood split in half. Okay. So I've split a piece off of the half to give myself a piece of wood. It starts out about three quarters of an inch thick and goes down to about a quarter. You can see that big wide heart in the middle of that. And I've got plenty of space out here that I don't have to drill into my heartwood. Now, what I really want to do is I want to see how dry this is. And I can usually tell that by the way it splits and cracks. But I also want to see how soft it is. So if I take my knife and I start to take shavings off of it and it just cuts like butter, Chances are it's going to be a pretty good thing for a bow drill set. I can also stick my thumb in into it and if my thumb nail leaves an imprint in the wood it's probably going to be a pretty good candidate for a bow drill set. So those are easy ways that you can check to see if the wood that you're selecting is going to be good or not. It doesn't matter what species the wood is. This goes right back to understanding the properties of materials. It doesn't matter what species of wood it is, it matters what the density of the wood is. If I can put my nail into it, if it cuts nice and soft and smooth, it's going to be good for a bow drill set. So our fireboard doesn't have to be anything fancy. We're trying to make a bow drill fire. We're not trying for a beauty contest. Fashion 
is one thing we want function so I want a good straight side on one side of this about three quarters to a half an inch thick I want a good space here between the sapwood and the heartwood and then I like to take and just cut a little bit of a chamfer on what's going to be the bottom of my board just like this and I'll explain to you why here in just a little while but that's just like a quarter of an inch chamfer right there okay so once I process the other half of my wood down I'm trying to find a spindle so I want a piece that's about as big around as my thumb and about the span of my pinky finger to my thumb in length to start off with this is going to give me that it's got a nice piece of heart running right down through the middle of it so when I carve that thing down I'll have a nice heartwood type spindle it'll have a lot of heartwood in it so it's not going to burn up near as fast as the board and that's really what I want I want the majority of the friction or the material to be removed from the board not the spindle so we'll process this down into something about the size of my thumb by just carving it down that's the only choice we've got and then we'll get what we want and we'll get back with you Okay, a couple things real quick here. Like, um, first of all, all these shavings are material for tinder. So I'm not going to get rid of them. I'm picking every one of them up off the ground I can get, and I'm going to use them to help me start my fire. Now, as I'm cutting into this and I'm putting my hands on it, it feels a little bit tacky. It's possible that this thing is still wet. I cut this off a down tree, but even if it's wet, we can possibly make it work. So I'm not going to give up on it just because it feels a little bit tacky. Now I've got it about the size or diameter that I want, about the size of my thumb, I need to prepare both ends of this spindle. And when I teach students how to do this, what I tell them is to visualize the pencil that you had in school. I want the end that's going to touch the fireboard or do the drilling to be about like a worn out eraser. Just rounded over and beveled like the eraser of a pencil. The other end, I want to look like my pencil. I want it fairly pointed, but worn down a little bit so that it creates the least amount of friction possible because I have the least amount of surface area by having a point on here touching that bearing block. Surface area is an important thing to understand. If I reduce friction area, or if I reduce surface area, I reduce friction. If I increase surface area, I increase friction. So I want one end to not have friction, one end to have more friction. So I need a point and I need a round. I'm going to go down about two inches on this spindle to start to carve this point. And again, this is the part that's going to be in my bearing block, is this point. And it doesn't have to be a drop dead point, really sharp point thing. It has to be like a worn out pencil. You're getting ready to go to the sharpener and hit it on the sharpener. And then I'll move up on the piece and just finally carve until I get a little bit of a worn out point on there. About like that's what I want to start out with. But I want to carve that point pretty far down. I want that angle to be pretty good because what's going to happen is as this wears down, you're going to start to shoulder out inside your bearing block. And this will be touching the sides of the hole in your bearing block. And you're going to lose friction on the bottom because you're going to increase friction on the top. And that happens to 90% of the people I teach the bow drill fire to. And when you start hearing squeaks and you start, it starts getting hard for that bow to turn and you're not getting enough friction, it usually is because you're shouldering out in the top of your bearing block. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So once I've got that where I want it, then I'm going to go to the other end and I'm really just going to start cutting it off and chamfering it all the way around about a quarter of an inch or a little bit more all the way around at first and then I'll cut that distance in half and go around it again just like this 
and I want those chamfers on there. I don't want that thing to be perfectly smooth because I want the most friction I can get. And then I'll cut the distance in half again until I get that thing rounded off so that, it, again, it looks like a worn out pencil eraser. And that's what I'm going to want in the end to start off with. Okay, I'm going to tell you that we got really lucky here as far as one thing. We have our spindle pointed on one end, bull nose eraser on the other end. We have our fire board that we're going to use. Now, as we were splitting this wood off, I picked this piece of wood up a minute ago and I noticed that there's a divot where there was a knot. You can see where it comes out this other side. There was a knot right in the heartwood. That's going to give me a perfect bearing block. Just like this. And because it's heartwood, it's going to be harder, most likely, than the tip of this drill. Which means it's not going to burn out very easily. So we're going to save that and we're going to try that for our bearing block first so we don't have to manufacture something. It was already given to us. Okay, so this brings us to our bow. I'm going to use just this crook branch. It's not too dead, so it's not going to snap. It's not too live, so it's not going to be too bendy to not put friction that I need or not put the tight hold on my spindle. It's about as long as my arm from armpit to fingertip, and that's what I like, about a three-foot long bow. And that brings us to cordage. Now, in keeping with Steve Davis's 18th century channel, I'm going to use a readily available 18th century cordage. Cordage that was made out of things like hemp and cotton and linen were a premium on the, on the frontier. It wouldn't have been something they would have wanted to waste. Big hemp ropes and things used on ships for anchors and sails and masts and things like that were available. And there were smaller ropes available as well made out of hemp. But it would have been a premium item. Something they would have had a lot of access to back then would have been rawhide from deerskins or some type of leather wang or thong. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a piece of rawhide that's been reverse wrapped two-ply cordage and stretched so that it's been stretched to its maximum limit, allowed to dry, then pulled down and lubricated with fixing wax. And we're just going to, it's got a loop in one end because as I said, it was reverse wrapped two-ply cordage and I'm just gonna wrap that loop tight, just like this. And then I'm going to pull down to this other end and leave myself a little bit of slack to get my, to get my spindle in there. I didn't quite cut my slot big enough to get this into. Let's see if I can stretch it in there. Yeah, not quite. There we go. There we go. Okay. Then we're just going to wrap that around the excess. We should be good. This is not going to be something you're going to be able to tighten up like you can tighten up cordage, obviously. But it will definitely do the job as long as you get a good clove hitch type knot in there or something. It's going to do the job of holding for you. And this is going to be our bow. Okay, the next portion of this operation is we need to do what's called the burning in process. And the burning in process involves us prepping this fireboard to have a spot where we know the spindle is going to be married to the board so that when we get ready to make an ember we'll already have that seated in there and ready to go. So what we're going to do is we're going to take and we're going to measure just like this and we want this hole or this spindle to be centered just a little bit further in than half the, or right at half the distance of the spindle itself. So if I lay that spindle on here and I move it over half again that's about where I want to start my hole. So I'll lay that on there and just mark that mentally. Then I will grab my knife. I'll put it on the board. Move this out of the way. And kind of drill in there a little bit. Keeping my hands out of the way. And moving the board. A little at a time just like this. and give myself a bit of a divot in there to work with so that that thing doesn't slip completely out as soon as I start to work it with the bow. Then I usually take it with my hands and just kind of push down and marry it in there a little bit and get a good dent in there where I'm going to start just like that. And that's usually enough. doesn't have to be too fancy. Now, at that point, we're going to start to burn this in. And 
one thing that you're going to need to do is you're going to want to lube this bearing block hole. And what I use for that is fixing wax. This is the same fixing wax I use for patch lube, same fixing wax I use for leather dressing, same fixing wax I use for doing anything that I need to lubricate like this. And I'll just schmooze a bunch of it inside that hole and push it in there just like that and fill up that gap with fixing wax. Okay, at this point we're ready to load our bow. So what I'll do is I'll take my spindle, I'll put the down end up and turn it over just like this and then force it in and I want it to be pretty tight. So that's gonna be good but I want my bow to the outside just like this with the spindle on the inside riding inside like this. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this board around so you guys can see better what's going on. And I'm going to put my larger end straight down here. At that point, I'm going to put my foot pretty close to my spindle. But I don't want my spindle to be touching my foot because that's going to cause friction. Then I'm going to put that bearing block right on top, just like this. Then I will start to, as soon as I get the sticker bush out underneath my leg here, then I will start to move it slowly at first with downward pressure so that I can see that it's going to ride correctly and if something's uncomfortable like that knot on my hand I'm moving that right now and you hear that squeaking Okay, once we get smoke, we know that we are burning in. And we don't need to get overexcited about that burning in because we don't want to wear any more off of our spindle than we absolutely have to right off the bat or our board because it may take us a little while to get our ember. Now we need to create our notch. Okay, so we've cut our notch in here at about 30 degree angles, not quite or just touching, the barely touching the edge of where we burned in. And the reason for that is as we drill in further, it's gonna open that up and it's gonna expand and it will be out here in the notch. There's no sense wasting our notch or wasting any material right now. The reason we had that chamfer on the bottom is so that we could let air in from the bottom. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a slightly chamfer, the bottom of this notch, just like this on both sides which is shear cuts and that's going to let more oxygen in on the bottom and that's important now what we need is a bird nest and a fire lay okay this is what I would call the proper amount of material for a good fire lay It's better off if it's just chaotic. Your fire will probably take off a whole lot better that way. Get yourself a good spot to put your tinder bundle into that you can just move this over the top of it when you get flames in there and you'll be good. Keep yourself some bigger stuff off to the side that you can add when your flames get above the fuel. You'll be all set. Okay. Now let's process our bird nest. And I've got a big conglomeration of stuff here from the shavings we took off to pine needles to barks. Some of it has been torn up a little bit. Some of it hasn't been torn up at all. But remember, we want lots of material in this bird nest that is both fine, coarse, and medium so that we have lots of areas that are highly combustible. The more of that we have, the better off we are. As we're processing this stuff, just let it lay loose. If there's any dampness to it, it'll help dry it out that way. A 
Remember, preparation is the key. The more you prepare, the better off you're going to be because you only want to do this once. And then you immediately want to be thinking about the next fire. And what am I going to do to make charred material so that I've got another fire that's going to be a whole lot easier to make than a bow drill? Because I don't want to have to mess around trying to keep that thing dry, keep that set from gathering moisture and all that business. I don't want to mess that if I don't have to. Once we've got most of this stuff processed down in three different piles, fine, medium, and coarse, and then we've got some little extra goodies here, pine needles, some bark, some wood shavings, things like that. We're going to put those off to the side here for a minute. What we're going to do is we're going to take our coarse stuff and wrap it with our medium stuff. Just like this, and we're going to try to start making kind of a donut configuration out of it. That's kind of a wad right there, I won't use that one. Then I'm going to take my fine stuff and I'm going to put that in the middle and start working my way out like this. Make that donut even bigger. Then I'm going to take some of the finest stuff I've got and that's going to be the most highly combustible. And I'm going to put that in the middle but I don't want to wad it up too much because I've got to get oxygen flow in there. All this other stuff can be peripheral around the outside. And these shavings can be sprinkled into the top of my fire lay right in here so they catch first when I put my tinder bundle inside. Any excesses of bark or pieces I've got laying around left over, I'll sprinkle them into where the flames are going to be licking on those right off the bat. And then I'll take this bird nest and I'll lay it right over here beside everything. Collect any fine stuff I've got on this tarp and see what I got laying here. Anything that's really fine, I'm going to put it in the middle. Anything that's not, I'll probably save it for the next time or save it as an emergency off to the side here to shove in there with my tender bundle if I need to. And I'm going to set this somewhere just off to the side on a couple sticks so that it's not collecting any moisture off the ground right here in front of my fire. One thing that we have to remember if we're doing this while we are carrying 18th century accoutrements or black powder in general is we need to make sure that we get our powder horn and our shooting bag completely away from any of this stuff so we're not carrying a grenade around with us. We don't want this near the fire. So we're going to take our bag and our powder horn and get it completely out of the area. Now, once we have done that we're ready to go. What I like to do with this stuff, once I've got my complete set done and ready to go, I like to just take five minutes. If I can afford it, I just take five minutes, relax, breathe, sit beside a tree, and get my breath. Because I only want to do this one time. When I get that done, I want to make sure that this fireboard, wherever it's going to be sitting, is on level ground. And I'm going to load my spindle and try to kind of go for broke the first time here. Posture and form are everything when it comes to a bow drill fire. Now I already can tell you I don't like this because I can already see this is going downhill. So we're going to stop and reposition ourselves. every bit of this into this bird nest and then I'm not going to get in a hurry if I've got all my materials correct I don't have to get in a hurry
Guys, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Steve Critter Davis, Stillwater Woodcraft, for allowing me to put this video on his channel. I feel like I'm just returning a long old favor. He's put lots and lots of videos on my channel at the Pathfinder School. He was the original instructor at the Pathfinder School and still is a guest instructor to this day. I encourage you to subscribe to his channels as well as all my other instructors listed on the right-hand side of my homepage on YouTube. We thank you for everything that you do for us, for our school, for our families, friends, and supporters. And we'll be back with another video as soon as we can. Thanks, guys.